Hey. Hey, so I'm calling up uh, some of the kids from Sanctuary and asking what they love most about their moms. Can you tell me what you love about your mom? I love, um, cause she cuddles me and she's the queen and she, and, uh. That she doesn't care when we get all dirty. That she baked us dinner good. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and one day she made some tacos and they were different kinds and we love them. Uh She's really nice to me. She's generous. Um, she cooks a lot of yummy meals. And she she sings us three songs when we go to bed at nighttime. Mom, and go to shopping and eat and get a lot of food for us. She's my best mommy. <laughs> she makes dinner a lot of the nights. Spending time with her. Yeah, that's a lot of love right there. <laughs> she plays with us. Um, <laughs> she's a very caring person. Yeah, what? she puts other people yeah. before her. Yeah. She gives me lots and lots of candies every day. Yeah. Even when our timer goes off for bed, she still keeps reading. <laughs> That's it, I say that. Do you guys love your mom? No. Yes. Yes. I love that she's so willing to do crafts. Uh, she tastes good at food. Yeah. That she that she does all the things I um tell her. When I go when me and Hubble sleep in the same bed. <laughs> Mommy lets you sleep in the same bed with Harper? That's a good one. Um, that I always get to snuggle with her. You say, I love you. What is like a, a funny thing that your mom does? Oh, uh, she you laughs do? when I do homeschooling, when I say E. I have no idea, actually. She's not very funny. <laughs> and she kept tickling us, and that's kind of funny. And Dad! Doing this. <laughs> she takes her chip and uh, she tries to get dip from my little brothers. <laughs> like she tries to steal the dip? Yeah. Like <laughs> it really makes them laugh. Her funny clown face. Make it mommy. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Yeah. She's standing right there behind the stairs. When she dances, she dances like like she like has like quirky dance moves. Like, Touch <laughs> her shoulders. Excuse me, um, I've got a joke. Why does the caterpillar fall onto a street? Why? Because the uh, boy kisses it. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something else funny that I that I do? No. That's it. <laughs> she craves Cheetos. Um, being being clumsy. I did not. <laughs> yeah, I throw munchies be silly. Munchies be silly, yeah. She never gets up in, until after, until, until, until it's time for breakfast. She tickles us. All right, I need to have you guys do one more thing. I'm going to count to three. I'm gonna go one, two, three, and then will you say Happy Mother's Day in whatever way you want. You ready? All right, one, two, three. Happy Yay. Mother's Day! <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, mothers. We hope you feel just so celebrated and honored for all that you do for your family and all that you do for our community too. So Happy Mother's Day. This is my house, my life. <laughs>
Before love came and grabbed me Never thought I'd see the sun again Without no hesitation You became my resurrection All the light came shining in Now I've got beauty for ashes And I've got joy for morning And I've got praise for heaviness Love is a miracle Now I've got beauty for ashes And I've got joy for morning And I've got praise for heaviness If you haven't joined us before, welcome to Sanctuary Church Online. My name is Jocelyn, and I am one of the leaders here. I also want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there, especially to, you know, my mama. Hey, mama. We are one church, three congregations, and a movement of missions that we call Outposts. Our vision is Jesus, our mission is renewal, and our way is love. If there are any ways we can serve you during this season, let us know by visiting us online. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad to have you with us. Here at Sanctuary, we believe that our story as a church is made up of all the individual stories of each of you gathered with us. And so we'd love to hear from you. 
What is God doing in your life in this season? What are you giving thanks for today? How can we pray for you? What needs do you have that we could help you with? We'd love to hear your story. And today, we actually wanna take this moment to create some space to pray and lament together. This past week, I'm sure you've heard news of the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, a 25-year-old Black man who in February was shot by two white men in Georgia. Events like this happen far too often in our nation. I ache my family. Again and again and again, I ache. The Black community aches. And we as followers of Jesus should all be aching. I don't know about you, but I am tired of aching like this. And so in the ache, in the morning, we lament and we cry out to God. Pray with me. God of justice and love, my heart is heavy. My heart is tired. Our hearts are tired. We are troubled by another killing and more injustice that is rooted in racism and white supremacy within our nation. Help us, our God, as we are once again confronted by the brokenness of the world in which we live. Help me, help us, our God, to come to you with broken hearts and to also examine ourselves. Let us not rush towards language of healing without first understanding the fullness of the injury and the depth of the wound. Let us not rush to speak cliches, but rather let us hear the grief and weep together. Let us not be afraid to see the ugliness, but wait, may we open our eyes and break our hearts. May we never be complacent in the face of unrighteousness. May we make no peace with oppression. May we, by your grace, have the strength to use our freedom in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations. Let us not be consumed by hatred and vengeance, but may we instead passionately pursue justice and redemption. Let us not be consumed by fear, but may we instead pursue a deep and transformative love. Let us not be consumed by despair, but may we instead have hope, knowing that you are our God who hears, that you are our God who sees, and that you are our God who saves. Amen.
He was and still is and will be through it all So come with me in the space between All the things unseen and this reckoning If you would like to talk to someone or receive prayer, you can click Request Prayer right here on your screen and someone from our team will pray with you right now. Now, let's practice generosity together before Andrew shares the message. This is something that we in the Sanctuary family do every week. It's one way that we can take care of each other. If you are new to worshiping with us, no pressure to give, you are our guests. But if you are part of the Sanctuary family, we invite you to give generously today. The different ways to do so are on the screen. Let's take a moment to remember why it is that we give. There is nothing we have that we have not received. To spend everything on ourselves and to give without sacrifice is to walk the way of death. But generosity is the way of those who call Jesus their Lord, who love with free hearts and serve with renewed minds, who withstand the delusion of riches. We are determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. We are determined to be faithful stewards of such a little thing as money that we may join God in the work of renewal. Above all things, we are determined to be generous because our Father is generous. It is the delight of His daughters and sons to share their Father's traits and to show what He is like to all the world. Welcome, everyone. I so miss seeing you. Uh, it's been so great uh, over the last couple of weeks to pop into home churches, getting to see people at midday prayer and the parents check in. It was especially awesome to see so many of you at Central Night uh, and the week before at East Side Night. Uh, I've been able to pop into the North uh, Zoom service. Uh, it's just been, it's been great to see you all in those places, but none of that fills the hug-sized hole in my heart. Um, I hope you're well. Uh, and as always, please, please reach out to us if you have uh, any needs at all, if you need anything, if you need to chat. Um, a big thanks, before I jump into the talk, I want to give a big thanks to everyone who helped coordinate uh, and drop off meals this week to frontline workers and all the others who are pouring themselves out in this season. Um, we are continuing our series called A New Normal. And basically what we're doing is reminding each other of, uh, of the fact that when things go back to some semblance of normal, um, you don't have to. We're asking the question, are we becoming more or are we becoming less in this season, in this uh, Kairos moment, if you tuned in last Sunday. And today I wanna talk about self-discovery. I wanna speak to the idea of examining your soul. So if you would join me in prayer as we kind of prepare our hearts to hear the text. Lord, as we take a moment of stillness and silence, we um, kind of tune into our breath. And I pray that we're just reminded that every breath is a gift. Every breath is grace. We know there's something powerful, Lord, when your people, even when they're 
disconnected like this when we open the scriptures together and we rally around learning about the person of Jesus. Lord, there's something beautiful and mysterious, uh, healing, encouraging, convicting that happens, Lord. So we pray, open our eyes that we would see you, our ears, Lord, that we would hear you, our hearts, Lord, that we would encounter and know you more. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. So I wanna talk about self-discovery and talk about this idea of examining your soul. On the journey of faith, it is so important that you take time to take account for who you are and where you are, examining who you are from the inside out. Self-discovery leads us into self-awareness. Uh, I don't know if you ever met somebody who seriously lacks self-awareness. I have uh, flown a lot this past year for one reason or another, and I've been amazed at how many people do not understand the international sign for, I am not available. I have my headphones on, uh, and still I will be the person who finds themselves next to the person that just wants to chat. And because I'm a pastor, I feel like I should connect, and I do, but usually I just wanna work and I wanna sleep or I wanna play, pray that the, uh, the plane doesn't crash. Um, and so I'm usually not necessarily sitting next to the rudest person on the plane, I'm just sitting next to the person that lacks any kind of self-awareness. Uh, it's the same kind of person who feels compelled to ask a woman if she's pregnant. Like, don't, don't ever do that. Like, can I get an amen from the mothers out there on Mother's Day? Like, men, unless a woman freely offers that info up to you, don't ask. I don't care how sure you are that she's pregnant. <laughs> all, all of us know self-awareness matters because if we can miss it socially, if we can be socially so unaware, uh, we can miss it spiritually. There are a lot of people who would say, uh, I'm a follower of Jesus. And, and yet when you get down to it, they don't really live that way at all. It's one thing to say I'm saved by grace or I have a new identity in Jesus or I have new life in Jesus, but you just keep defaulting to your old identity. We need to be a people that stop and take time to examine what's coming out of us because that will tell us who we really are right now. Not your projected self, your actual self, the culture of your heart now, not the vision of who you want to become. If you're like me, you're constantly living in the future. Like what's coming, what will be fixed, what will be even better. And we need to come to terms with our actual self. When you're dating someone, you're dating their projected self. And when you get married, you will meet their actual self. Um, when you, you, you go on those dates when you're dating and everybody is like in the perfect outfit and hair is did just right. And when you get married, you, you get slippers and you get like very old crusted PJs. Not that I know anything about that. Um, <laughs> examining yourself comes up again and again in the scriptures. Like thinking about like how do we, how do we become more aware of what's happening in our own hearts comes up again and again in letters and laments and prayers. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul writes to this church in Corinth, he says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless of course you fail the test. He's saying like, test yourselves to make sure you aren't deceiving yourself, saying one thing and living another. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. Galatians talks about fruit. Like if you're a healthy vine or a tree or a pick your plant of choice, you should see some fruit. The fruit of the spirit, it says, is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. These are the things that should be coming out of you. In that same letter uh, in Galatians 6, 3 to 5, Paul writes, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. This verse is like for like every time I stepped onto a soccer field or a basketball court or a jazz band in high school, like I deceive myself. Examining, testing, this is about confronting your actual self. Why? Because if you never discover who you are now, you'll never, um, you'll never realize or begin to know who you were meant to be. The starting point is discovering where you are. 
know if you've ever gotten lost in the mall or get confused on where you parked your car. Like, what do you do? You go to the big kiosk, you go to the big map, and then before you look for the place you're going to, you look for the big star that says you are here. Because my starting point of the journey is where I actually am. So today we would just wanna confront who we really are. And I'm excited for this today because I think this is a perfect time for this confrontation of the self. Because we are all in one way or another being squeezed right now. We are two months into this corona moment. <laughs> and when all this has happened, when all of this squeezing and pressure comes in general in life, when obstacles and challenges and pressure comes, we start to show what's really inside. I think we've got enough time under our belt of being in isolation of starting to like be able to stop and pause and go, what is coming out in the midst of all of this pressure? A moment like this asks us the question, what are you full of? Like what's actually inside of you? What's good and what's broken? In, uh, in Lamentations 3, uh, the writer is being squeezed. Like everything is going wrong. The whole book is lament. God, where are you? How could you? He's sorting out his feelings and he's sorting out his thoughts on God in the midst of pressure, in the midst of obstacles. He writes things like this. I am the man who has seen affliction. I've been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. He says, I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. But then he changes it up. He says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. And then in verse 40, he says, so let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. As he's being squeezed, he recalls God's faithfulness and this seems to cause him to examine what's happening in his soul. As we look around our world, as our world is getting squeezed, not everything that's coming out of it is good. There is good, don't get me wrong. There's great art and unity and compassion and generosity, but we're seeing all sorts of brokenness and racism and fear and evil and misinformation. In your heart today, I just wanna ask like, what's coming out of you as you're being squeezed in this moment with the pressure up, with being cooped up at home, with loneliness maybe setting in, what is coming out that you didn't know was in there? Pressure. Pressure has a way of helping us examine who we really are. In the book of Proverbs, it describes the soul as having deep waters. Like you are complex. In the depth of your being, you are complex. And a pandemic can actually be a helpful tool to help you go swimming around in there. Like, what are you stressed about? What are you worried about? What are you anxious for? What are you burdened by? What did you bring to this screen today? So I wanna do something different. I wanna hand you a few questions that I believe are gonna help you examine yourself. Because if we wanna be fully alive, if we want the desires of our heart to align with perfect love and perfect peace, with truth, if we want to become more, then we have to move beyond talking about the importance of becoming aware of who we are and where we are at. We have to actually do it. So the pastor theologian uh, A.W. Tozer gives us seven things to contemplate when it comes to examining your soul. And he calls them rules for self-discovery. And he's got seven of them. So what I'd like to encourage you to do is grab a pen, paper, notes from your, you know, notes section from your phone. And I wanna quickly walk through these seven rules. And I wanna give you some time before I close to wrestle with them for a second, to kind of get started. So the first rule for self-discovery uh, for A.W. Tozer is, um, the first question to help us examine our heart is what do we want? We have real desires 
and, and then we have our, our truest desires. And closing the gap is critical in becoming a rooted, grounded person in Christ. If you're like me, you have the things that you want on the surface and then the things you really want, your deepest wants. And those things just conflict far too often. See, our hearts are oriented primarily by desire, by what we love. The Christian understanding of desire is much more sophisticated than the sort of follow your heart view that dominates so much of our culture. We believe it's actually like a war of desires, of a war of loves. You have spirit and you have flesh and the flesh is what a neurobiologist would call the animal brain. Like our animal brain is the place of domination, of survival, of sexual pleasure, things like that. It's like primal. And right now it's easier than ever to be distracted by our animal brain uh, in their digital age because you have marketing departments all over the world who have figured out how to manipulate the vulnerabilities in human psychology, monetize this part of our animal brain that's wired for comparison and competition and a deep urge that we all feel to look and feel good. All of that just to get us to buy a product. They play on our base desires all the while there are deeper ones our truest ones in Jesus that are just far better. And the Bible makes it clear that the real and the true have a very troubled relationship. At the end of the day, you are what you love, James K. Smith says. For instance, it's normal to want success and on the surface, striving for achievement may seem to be enough, but we have to dig deep to find the motivation behind a want like that because there are God motivations and there are dark ones. Like it says in Psalm 37, God wants to give us the desires of our heart. There's like a promise that God will give us the desires of our heart, the deepest and truest God desires. So answering the question, what you want the most will tell you what you value the most. Number two, what we do with our leisure time. So you spend roughly 56 hours sleeping 56 hours working or commuting or thinking about work, that should be a little less, but let's just round that out, which leaves about 56 hours left of free time. Examining what you spend your time on, Tozer argues, um, will determine who we are. For the follower of Jesus, free time isn't cheap. We're encouraged to infuse our leisure time with value. Paul says, make the most of your time. I think if you're taking notes, there are three filters that can help guide our use of our free time. Uh, and they're rest, improvement, and passion. When we rest, it shows that we trust God's in control. When we care about our mind, our bodies, and our soul, uh, when we sow truth into them, we become good stewards of what God's given us. And when we put our energy towards the thing we would do, even if we didn't get paid for it, that's where we find passion. We must learn to leverage our time because as life progresses, our time decreases. Maximizing our spare time and creating value around it will prevent us from wasting it. So answering the question, what am I doing with my free time will reveal your level of intentionality. It will, as it says in Hebrews, keep you from drifting. Three is the company we enjoy. So this is just about examining who you're around, who's in your circle of friends, who are you seeing? Are you surrounded by people who will lift you up or drag you down? The company you keep is a reflective mirror on both who you are now and who you're gonna be. I have a friend who always says, show me your four closest friends and I will show you who you're becoming. I think he's right. Relationships play a major part in examining your soul and the direction of your life. Think of like oxen in a field. And depending on who you are yoked to can make a big difference between going in a straight line or going around in circles. There's this uh, story in the gospels of a paralyzed man whose friends do whatever it takes to get Jesus uh, to be healed. And they can't get through this massive crowd. They're trying to get their paralytic friend to Jesus. Massive crowd in front of this house. Can't get through. So they climb on the roof, cut a hole in it and lower their friend down. The paralyzed man has... I think some like really good friends here. Like they lower him down and he is healed. Um, his friendship, the people that he was surrounded with, like that leads to his healing and forgiveness of sin and soul restoration. It's a crazy story. Sometimes it takes the faithfulness of others to lead us to our fullest potential. 
And that's the ultimate marker of the best relationship that any of us can have. So answering the question, like who's in your circle, that'll help show you who you're becoming. I don't know what number we're on now, four? Four. How you use your money. (laughs) Uh, You can usually tell what people value by looking at their schedule, but also looking at their bank statement. Many times we choose not to practice generosity until we have like a certain amount of money. We withhold our finances from God or from others, trusting in our ability to do more with it. And if you're a follower of Jesus, we have to remember it's about getting our heart right first, not attaining more money. Where our money is spent shows what we're interested in and where our heart's invested. I think an important principle is God never intended for us to hold on to what he originally gave us. In the scriptures, um, people are blessed to be a blessing. No one's just blessed for blessing's sake. It's always to bless others. And a moment like this can help us examine where our security comes from, where our fear is and who we trust. And what we really believe about Jesus's words that it's better to give than to receive. So answering the question, how are you using your money right now is gonna tell you where your treasure really is. Five, what we think about most. So like a train, our thoughts kind of lead us to a destination either positive or negative. And the beauty is we often have a choice on which train we decide to get on. The scripture says, do not let your hearts be troubled. The scriptures say, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. I love these verses because they remind me that I have some agency over my thought life. If our train of thought is in line with God's word or if it's foolish and unwise, we should like let it pass. If it's not in line with what God wants, we need to let it pass. Are you gravitating toward anxiety and doubt or are you clinging to hope and faith and joy? Philippians 4.8 says, uh, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, write these down, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Answering the question, what am I thinking about the most, will tell you a lot about how you're feeling and where your head is really at. A.W. Tozer's next principle is what we laugh at. Like, what are you laughing at? I love this. Like, what is filling you with joy? What's bringing you true joy? God wants us to find our joy Um, not just through like good times, but have it being rooted in him, trusting in his faithfulness. To find true joy, we, we have to understand God is our source of joy, choosing to stay connected to him and not just around the things that reflect him. Knowing God um, is our satisfaction, is our satisfaction means intentionally seeking a place and time to connect with him, to rest in his promises, to feast and enjoy God's good creation. Joy, even in mourning, is possible with God, as we sang earlier today. Joy is not situational. Joy is actually kind of supernatural. You'll find that as you continue to seek Him. He'll manifest that true joy in your life by turning uh, your circumstances and circumstances like this into deep contentment. So answering the question, like, what are we laughing at, will help us know what's bringing us true joy what's really getting us through the day with a smile on our face. And last one, who and what we admire. If you're still taking notes, three areas to observe that can help us determine the aim of our admiration. Who we look at, what we study, and how we behave. I think these are all indicators of what we're focused on. So zeroing in on what we hold in high esteem can show us what direction we're headed in and who will become. Doing the things that have, um, that have our attention that we admire lead us back to Jesus. My friend John Tyson says, attention leads to admiration. What we keep our attention on will actually lead us to a place of admiration where distraction leads us to despair. Are our eyes fixed on Jesus? So answering the question, who and what do you admire will help us know what has our attention. So let's just take a few minutes 
and reflect on these seven things. Let's take seriously this call to examine our hearts, to examine our souls, to ask, all right, as we're being squeezed right now, what's coming out of us? Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise, and seize me some melodious song sung by flame. upon it mount of thy redeeming love oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to idea as we close. Whatever you ingest, you'll digest. So what would it look like for you to make a decision today in light of all that's going on? In light of maybe any little thing that came up as you were examining your soul a bit there? Like what would it look like for you to make a decision to start ingesting the right sorts of things? Where do you need to start ingesting more gratitude? ingesting more of the word, ingesting more worship. Thinking about that passage we read earlier in Philippians, uh, whatever's true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable or excellent or praiseworthy, where do you need to be thinking about those things in light of the recognition that where you're being squeezed, there's some unhealth coming out? Because look, whatever you get inside of you is going to come back out in one form or another in this season. The question will be when we get through this, and we will get through this, is what do you want your testimony to be? When you reflect on this moment, what, <laughs> what do you want to be reminded of? Do you wanna be reminded of the impatience and anger that came out of you? Do you, do you wanna be reminded of the selfishness or small thinking that you had? Do you wanna be reminded of your greed and the fact that you only thought about you and your loved ones? Do you want to be reminded of your fear and how you 
trembled and how you listened to the voice of the enemy? Do you want to be reminded about the fact that you were worried far too much and you imagined things that were really never going to happen and you didn't take hold of the imagination God gave you and instead of coming up with solutions, you created more problems or whatever it is? Or do you want to get through this thing and say, no, when, when life squeezed me, my faith came out. <laughs> When this moment squeezed me, I had a peace that transcended all understanding, a peace that guarded my heart and mind because I'm with Christ Jesus, because I examined myself and saw the ways I wasn't aligned because I didn't let my heart be troubled. So like the writer in Lamentation said, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Returning to the Lord is just this idea of repentance. Repentance just means like to turn around. It's to realize the extent to which we have been living a way that doesn't lead to life. It's to realize maybe, maybe even for the first time, how far we've fallen short of what we were made to be. It's this realization uh, that's, that we call repentance. It's like a serious turning away from patterns of life which deface or distort our humanity. Repent and believe the good news, Jesus says, the good news that God has fully known to us, that he's making all things new, that his kindness will lead us to this turning around. It's like his love for us will move us to want to examine ourselves because we want to be aligned with that love at all costs. We want to be in harmony with that song that we all hear when we quiet our souls. To repent and believe is to turn around and to trust that you're loved and known, to trust that he's king, to trust his grace, to experience this salvation and this freedom. So may you this week, may, may God give you the strength and courage to go there, to examine yourself, to establish new rhythms and new practices, to become more in harmony and in line with who God made you to be, to live up to what you've already attained in Christ Jesus. Peace be with you.